Uh, a couple of Sundays that I want you to get on your calendar for special days. Um, Sunday night, November the 5th, that's two weeks from tonight, um, we're having a very, very special service right here in the sanctuary. As you know, we regularly have a Sunday evening service now. It meets over in the bridge at 6 p.m. You're welcome to come out tonight, all right, uh, and join us for our 6 o'clock evening service. Uh, less, uh, uh, less formal than Sunday morning, even more casual, uh, a great way to meet others in our congregation and uh, to hear others preach. Um, and so what we have Tonight is, I, I want you to show up tonight. I just want to scare the bejabbers out of Rick Cardoso, all right? He is 19 years old. He is going to preach his first sermon to big church, okay? He has, uh, he's, he's preached some sermons to our high school group that he's been a part of, but this is his first opportunity uh, to adults, all right? And so uh, come out tonight, hear a guy, encourage him on his very first time uh, to preach. We're excited about what God is calling Rick to do. Then on November the 5th, we're having a very, very special service on Sunday night. It will be in the sanctuary. We are having an ordination service for our associate pastor, Mark, and our youth pastor, Chris Bishop. Uh, they've been called to ministry for a few years, for the last couple of years here at New Hope. We've licensed them. License is kind of like their driving permit, okay? Ordination is like getting the driver's license. Uh, a license is for one year at a time. Ordination is for life, uh, as long as they behave themselves. And um, <laughs> uh, so this will be a very special service, a little more formal than most of our services here. If you want to dress up, as I have done today, some of you thought I forgot how to wear a suit, but when the weather's nice, it's really easy. Uh, but this will be a very nice evening. It'll be a rather formal, it's kind of like a graduation ceremony as uh, uh, we go through certain steps to bring them to this point of ordination. We'll have a light reception following that, and certainly uh, cards and or gifts are appropriate for them to commemorate that very special day. And that will be on Sunday evening, November the 5th. Then uh, two weeks later, on Sunday morning the 19th, it's a special Sunday for us here, and that is, uh, Tim Kepler, where are you? Right Step out here, my good man. My twin brother. Ah. Uh, our mothers weren't very original with our names. It was just Tim and Tim, all right? Yeah, but they gave him better hair. Um, I'm having a bad yeah. <laughs> Anyway, all of you know Tim. Uh, Tim's been with us for several years now. Tim and I met doing prison ministry together, and uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful relationship. Last year, we started something that we're continuing this year, and that's in the month of November. We take one of our Sundays, and we want to recognize the ministry that he heads up, that he leads. Uh, it's called From Fulsom to Forgiven. Many of you know that Tim spent uh, some time at state expense at Folsom Prison and uh, was there that his life got turned around. You've heard his testimony if you've been here very long. And so he has a ministry that takes him back into prison where they let him out every time that he shows up. Uh, and uh, he does some incredible ministry there. And that's how we met, was doing some ministry things together. One of the biggest challenges in doing prison ministry is uh, the processing of getting the volunteers and the leaders and the equipment in that you need to do a yard event. And the thing that always delays the beginning, have we ever started a yard event on time? No. Never, not once. Uh, as hard as you try, with everything that my sister goes through for organization, she's a little anal about that kind of stuff, uh, as much as she works hard to get it done, uh, you can only make government employees work at a certain pace, all right, and, and processing things at a certain way. And because there's so much, it often gets delayed. And so Tim has had this wonderful dream idea and vision is to streamline that by having a large truck, all right, when I say truck, I mean an enclosed vehicle, all right, that is large enough that when you, you just pull it into the prison yard, you drop down the front wall and you put down the side walls and you already have your stage and your sound equipment. All you have to do is plug it in. And that would expedite things and make ministry so much more effective. And uh, so last year at this time, we started a fundraiser uh, to doing that. He thinks maybe he's found a vehicle and maybe on the 19th it might be here on display so we could see what we're talking about. But yeah, but we're, so we're, we're going to have a special day, and we are going to have a special offering to help raise funds for uh, Tim's ministry from Folsom 
to forgiven. So you won't want to miss that day. He's also bringing in a guest speaker for us that day. It's another gentleman that we have engaged in prison ministry with. He's from the Sacramento area. His name is Dean Johnson. Ladies, the best way I could describe him to you is he is everything that Tim and I are not, all right? Uh, he is tall, he is young, he is broad in the shoulders, he is narrow in the hips. Uh, he's a hunk, all right? Um, uh, he's also single, girls. He is single, okay? Uh, he is also, ex- do what? How, uh, he's in his early 30s, right? Yeah, early 30s, probably 32, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, he has a great testimony as well. He's also exceedingly strong, uh, not only spiritually, but physically. He takes soda cans and crushes them while they're still full. Uh, watch out, sitting on the front row, all right, that Sunday. He takes rebar and he bends it in his teeth. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, um, let's see, what, what else? Oh, he tears phone book. Uh, do you guys know what a phone book is? Okay, okay all right, all right. Uh, yeah, yeah, but he takes thick, you know, the old kind of fun, and he rips them in two. He, he does incredible physical feats of strength. Uh, but then what is most impressive is, as he tells you, his own journey to faith in Jesus Christ. And so Dean is going to be with us that day. It's going to be a good day, isn't it? It's going to be a great day. And, and I might have overstepped my bounds. In the, I told the 8 o'clock crew service was going to be in here that Sunday. So what does that mean? That means all three services will be here. Will be in here That's that great. Sunday. Okay. Do you hear me, Milo? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Good job. So we're excited about that. Um, let's see. So that was November 5th. That is November 19th. November the 12th is going to be Volunteer Appreciation Sunday here at the church. So uh, we'll be recognizing all of you, and there are hundreds of you who volunteer throughout the year, and so you're going to be receiving some very special love from us that day. Uh, Ladies, please take note of the ornament exchange that's coming up the Monday after Thanksgiving. That is November the 27th. Uh, If you made a pledge to 1040i and our Africa Mission Project in February, uh, those pledges are due by next Sunday. Please take the opportunity to read the insert about our volunteer recognition, Eric Olson, who leads up our Celebrate Recovery ministry and has been involved in so many other things around our church family. It is well worth your read. We are also still in need of about six more sponsors for kids uh, in the village of Neon and Ivory Coast, Africa. So if you haven't yet picked up a sponsorship, they're $585 that feeds, clothes, provides the tuition and the education and the books for an entire year for a student. And when we say junior high, that really gets them through their high school education. Um, Terminology is a bit different. Junior high is high school, high school is college, okay, kind of in their arena. So uh, we'd love to have you finish those off. Um, Also, you have an opportunity if you didn't get, how many of you got my email this week about desserts? Okay, all right. Um, Tuesday evening is the Rescue Mission fundraising banquet. Rescue Mission fulfills an incredible need in our community. And uh, one of our small groups, all right, uh, has helped take part in that over the last couple of years. And one of the things that they really appreciated last year was when so many homemade desserts from New Hope showed up. They go on auction tables, all right, that people can bid on in silent auctions and take home with them. And they can pay just a little bit more and they can eat them after dinner, all right, uh, at, at the at, at the banquet. So if, uh, if you can make a homemade dessert and you didn't get the email, uh, if you could deliver it here to the church by noon tomorrow, they will come pick it up and get it prepared so that it is there on Tuesday evening. But thank you all for bringing them today if you got that message. Let me highlight a few prayer requests. Uh, we're glad that uh, Lawrence is doing well. Uh, his family had to get up out of church last Sunday uh, because Lawrence was having some difficulties breathing. He is okay, and we're grateful for that. He does have some health challenges, so continue to remember him. Uh, Many of you know Gay Gentry in our church. Uh, Gay had a real trauma this past week, uh, actually on Friday. Um, Gay had a high school sweetheart, and uh, after high school, they kind of got going separate directions, did not see each other for about 35 or 40 years. His wife passed away, and uh, Gay, uh, 15 years ago, went through a divorce. Uh, And about three years ago, through the modern miracle of Facebook, they reconnected. And uh, uh, 
began a relationship, long distance. He lives in Texas, she lived here, but uh, it, it's been good. And we've, we've had Danny here in our church on several occasions over the last 18 months. And uh, Danny died at the end of the week unexpectedly from an asthma attack and uh, complications from that. So a huge, huge surprise to his family, to Gay, to all of us who got the news. So please be praying for Gay and also be praying for Danny's family in Texas as they go through this. Uh, Jean Montgomery, who's part of this service, wave Jean so they know who I'm talking about. All right. Uh, Jean got a call from her cousin at the end of this week, and uh, her cousin's daughter, Donna, uh, was bitten by a black widow spider. She is in critical care in the hospital as they are trying to find the right serum to address this particular poison. So if you'd be remembering her, her name is Donna. Please also be praying for Isabel Bogdanoff, who is, uh, uh, is recovering from, um, um, what, what, what was broke? I forgot. I'm brain dead this morning. What did she bro- Hip. She broke her hip. I talked to her this week. I just couldn't remember. Um, so just be praying for Isabella as she recovers from that. We had two memorial services this past week, one for Teddy Miller's sister uh, right here at the church. Uh, a. Lynn was 49 years old. She was born as a Down syndrome baby, had a, a, a really wonderfully long life with Down syndrome. Uh, we had a wonderful celebration here, but continue to remember them as, as they go through this process. And then my barber, Paul Williams, who used to sit right about there for three or four years until his... Um, Lung disease got too advanced and he could hardly leave home. Uh, We had his celebration out at the mobile home park where he and his wife Claudette lived. Paul cut my hair from the time I was 14 years old. It dawned on me that I used to ride my Stingray bike with a banana seat and a sissy bar to his barber shop. And I drove uh, to his barber shop in a variety of different places. Uh, let's see here. I drove a Chevy Vega and a Ford Pinto and a Chevy Sprint and a Delta 80. I went through all the cars that I had driven to get my hair cut to him through the years. Uh, he stopped cutting my hair just four years ago when he, he retired. Um, my greatest joy about knowing Paul Williams is sitting right there in that seat one Sunday morning is when he raised his hand and gave his life to Jesus Christ. Uh, and he shared that story with his entire family, which I just found out um, visiting with him yesterday. Paul was in uh, Kaiser Hospital a year ago. Uh, didn't look like he was going to go home at that time. And um, Paul went home two days later. When he got home, he told his wife a story. He said, Claudette, he said, while I was in the hospital, and you all didn't think I was coming home, he said, I had a dream. He said, I can't tell you that it was real but it's real to me. And he said, here's what happened in my dream. He said, I walked right up to Jesus and we began to talk about what heaven was like. And Jesus told me how incredible this place called heaven is. And he said, and then he told me, it's not your time yet. You got a little more time. And he said, I woke up the next day and everybody was shocked. And he said, and I got to go home the following day. And Here's what Claudette told me after that. She said, I got to tell you, even though he had accepted Christ, he was still nervous every time he went to the hospital. He said, but after that day, he was not afraid to die. And in fact, he talked about, I can't wait when I finally do get to see what Jesus told me about. And he said he was at perfect peace in these last days. He said also two other things happened. Number one, he started reading his Bible a whole lot more than he ever had before. And he wanted always to have a Bible study book here. And Milo, I'll pass this on to you for the sound system uh, and those who work the computer back there. Uh, His wife said he could not wait till every Sunday service got posted onto the website because He had the TV in front of his hospital bed there in the the living room, and he couldn't wait to see it posted so he could watch the service. And she said last Father's Day, he was watching the service, and he just started laughing like crazy. And I walked in and said, what are you laughing at? He said, I'm laughing at Tim. (laughs) He said, well, what's so funny this time? I don't know if some of you remember, but I passed out a few cigars to people on Father's Day, and he just thought that was the funniest thing he'd ever seen in church was passing out cigars. Uh, But anyway, please be praying for Claudette. They were married for 38 years. Well, that's enough family life today, so I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering, and then we are going to get engaged into our worship and our message today. Would you come wait on us, please? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the love that you share with us. Thank you for the friendships that you bring into our world. As... um, as I had the opportunity to prepare for both services this week of, um, of, of the passing of someone's life from our presence into yours. 
As I thought about Aileen, I realized the only reason that I had the privilege of sharing in her service is because of the friendship of Teddy and Christy Miller, a friendship that started over a wedding that matured and blossomed over the next uh, 14, 15 years um, in, in, into a deep friendship and engagement and ministry together. And I say thank you for that. I think about how, how Father, almost, almost 50 years ago, not quite, but almost 50 years ago, because of Gene Fry, I started getting my hair cut at Headhunter, and I met Paul Williams. Had no idea that that relationship that would begin then would end up in the kind of relationship that it did. And so I say thank you for the friendships you've brought into my world. And I can say about, about that so many who are sitting right here in the sanctuary today. I am so, so greatly blessed. Thank you. Father, for the privilege of giving and sharing today, we do so out of love and, and, and desire to see your work accomplished through our lives, through the ministry of New Hope Church and your kingdom work locally and around the world. And so we give, Father, not because I hope we don't give because we feel pressure or because we're trying to earn favor with you, but we give out of, out of deep gratitude to your generosity that you've given to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Father, our tithes and offerings don't begin to compare to the generosity that you had for us. And so we say thanks today for the privilege of, of sharing and what you still want to do around the world. We trust you with the needs we've talked about today. For Donna, who's been bitten by a black widow. For, um, for Isabel, who's recovering from a broken hip. For others in our congregation who are still going through chemotherapy and radiation. We trust you for all of these needs and so many more. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Boy, Bo, T Tim couldn't have picked two better songs uh, to go with today's sermon. Uh, back me up to the one just before this one, uh, Come Thou Fount. Um, to take me to the chorus, um, if you would, please. Uh, yeah. Come Thou Fount, Come Thou Keen, Come Thy Precious Prince of Peace. If... if if you've turned to the book of Haggai yet, and you probably wouldn't have because I hadn't told you to do so yet, um, there's a verse that we're going to read in Haggai chapter 2 today. And if you don't know where Haggai is, um, it's between Zephaniah and Zechariah. If that did not help you any, it's between Psalms and Matthew, all right? It's just two pages long. It's not very big. It'll take you a while. Or, or, or just turn to your table of contents, and it'll give you a page number. Uh, but there's a verse, uh, and it's not part of the sermon today, but I do want to point it out because of this particular song. Uh, there's, uh, verse 15 says, now give careful thought. Give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another stone in the Lord's temple. That word for temple which is used in chapter 2 of Haggai, is a very different word than the word translated temple in Haggai chapter 1. We wouldn't understand that just reading the English because in English, both of those Hebrew words are translated temple. But there is a not, subtle, not so subtle difference in the two words. And I think it's important, particularly since we've sung this song. And, and let me just do a little background. In, in the first sermon on this book of Haggai that we did, because this is all about the problem of the returning Israelites, returning from slavery back to their hometown, being reminded their temple was destroyed when they were carted off into slavery 70 years before. And they were, they were directed by God rebuild my house, rebuild my temple. And they stopped doing it. They got started. They got discouraged because there's no way it could be as beautiful as the one that Solomon built. And so they just threw God out and they started building themselves beautiful, luxurious homes. And God let it go on. He was very patient with them. And finally, he sends them the prophet Haggai. He sends them the prophet Ezra to challenge them about their lack of diligence for what was important. And as we've studied the book of Haggai, I've wanted you to remember it's not so much the brick and mortar buildings, though that was part of what it was back in those days. But God has given us different perspectives throughout Scripture of what His temple is. 
And so as we think of the word temple, I want us to think about all three of them. One is not more right than the other. Each one of them have their place. One of the expressions of the temple is the actual facility, the actual place set aside, committed, consecrated as a place of worship and as a beacon to the community. What's the condition of the facility? The second aspect of the word temple or tabernacle that we'll find in the scriptures is God's people. That's first and foremost. It always has been about the children of Israel, not the temple, but the children of Israel as God's chosen people were directed by God as a people, a fellowship, a temple, a tabernacle of folks to congregate together in a place committed to him. And then the writings of Paul to the Corinthian church takes it another step. After the finished work of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and now Jesus in his last message said, I am going to go to my Father and I am going to send back to you another. It is the Comforter. It is the Holy Spirit. It is so that God can now indwell once again the boys and the girls and the women and women who by faith put their trust in Jesus Christ. And Paul now says to the Corinthian church, your body, yours is a different shape than mine. Dean Johnson, who will be here in a few weeks, his is a different shape than about anybody else I know. But whatever the shape of the body, Jesus says your body is the living temple of the holy God. So as we talk about the temple, from Haggai's day to this song, we're talking about, yeah, facility, yes, the fellowship, us together, and also your own life and my own life. So this Old Testament book is an allegory of what it is that God wants to do in and through us in all three areas. Our physical life, our fellowship together as a body of believers, and as a community known as New Hope Church, one small part of God's kingdom work here on earth. I'm telling you all that to get back to this. This word temple, in chapter 1, it's translated temple but its other primary translation is house. Now, that's not life-shattering. But what I'm about to tell you is. In chapter 2, the different Hebrew word for temple here, its other primary translation is not house. It is palace. You ought to be going, wow! Wow! And you're saying, why? Who lives in a palace? The king lives in the palace. In chapter 1, referring to what they had been doing, it wasn't the place where the king was living. The king wasn't in residence in their hearts and in their actions. By chapter 2, after some changes have been made, he said, now what you're doing is you're dealing with the palace. The palace is where the king lives. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride, to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. The last song we sang. This is so good. Uh, next, next one. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, Jesus. When we put Jesus at the heart of our worship, then our heart will be in our worship. When it's not, then it's just ritual. Next slide. Keen of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours every single day breath. Haggai's neighbors could not build a temple that looked like Solomon's. God didn't care about its appearance. He cared about their heart. I can't sing like my twin brother Tim, but God doesn't care how my voice sounds. He cares about how my heart is with him. 
And I got to tell you, I could stop right there and I would have preached the message of Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. But I still have 28 minutes. Actually, I have 18 minutes. Okay, let's jump in and see what we can do in 18 minutes. Chuck Swindoll shared the following story in one of his books. A few years ago, an angry man rushed through the the Rijks Museum of Amsterdam until he reached Rembrandt's famous painting, Night Watch. Then he took out a knife and he slashed it repeatedly before he could be stopped. Just a brief time later, a very distraught and hostile man slipped into St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome with a hammer and he began to smash Michelangelo's beautiful sculpture, the Pieta. Two cherished works of art were severely damaged. But what did the officials of those two places do? Did they throw them in the garbage? Did they shove them in a closet and forget about them because they were damaged goods? Absolutely not. Using the best experts and the best craftsmen, they worked with the utmost care and precision. They made every effort to restore those treasures. And by God's sovereign grace, He's doing the same thing in your life and mine. Every one of us in this room, we're damaged goods. We've been marred by our own sin and rebellion. And if you haven't figured that out yet, you are in deep doo-doo. I'm just telling you, all right? You are in serious trouble if you haven't figured that one out yet. All of us are damaged goods, and yet God did not shove us into a closet. He didn't throw us out in the garbage heap. He has, he has with the utmost care, extended His grace to us, and He says, I want to restore you to the original design and beauty and purpose that I had when I created you. Whether we are restoring a historic building or a vintage home or an antique car or a priceless piece of art, restoration takes time. We had the opportunity to go through Mount Vernon, George Washington's home in, in, uh, outside of Washington, D.C., and we had access to every room in his mansion except for two. And two of those rooms we could look at from both sides of the room as we went through another room or a hallway, but we had to look at it through glass that had been bolted to the door frame of the entrances and the exits of those two rooms. They were two bedrooms in the residence. And one of the rooms that we looked into those two rooms from was a room that for about four years before had been shielded off from visitors going through it because it had been in the process of restoration. A 250-year-old home going through some massive renovations. And what was their goal? To restore it to its original design and purpose. It wouldn't have taken them years just to have slapped a coat of paint and put some new bedding on everything. They could have done that in just a matter of days or weeks. But they wanted to restore those painstakingly to their original design and purpose. Restoration takes time. When God begins to do a work in the lives of His people, there are certain phases that will take place. There are times when God's children turn away from Him. Often this is followed by a time of of excessive anger and ongoing rebellion when we refuse to acknowledge that we are walking and living in sin. There comes a time of God's discipline and chastisement where God wants to get our attention because we have been sliding backwards. Then comes a time of discovery and realization when when we discover that, yes, we have been participating in sin and this must be coupled then with repentance and a desire to return like the prodigal son did to his father. When this occurs, restoration of our lives is now possible. After restoration has done its work, then progress and fruitfulness is possible through our lives. If you happen to have shown up today at New Hope and you're not where you need to be in your walk with the Lord, my prayer is this process of restoration begins today. 
Over the past few weeks, we've been examining the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem. In chapter 1, we discovered the idleness and inactivity of Israel. God confronted and rebuked them because they were building luxurious homes while the temple was in ruins. God's place in their lives had been shoved to the rear by selfishness. And through the prophet Haggai, the Lord called on his people to consider their ways. Three times in verses 10 through 19, give careful thought, consider your ways, think carefully about this. As we arrive at the midway point of chapter 2, it becomes apparent that more than this building called the temple was going to be restored. Though it was important to the Lord that this temple be rebuilt, his main concern was not about the brick and mortar, but first and foremost, God wanted to see the relationship between his people and himself restored to the right place. He wanted to see their worship restored. He wanted to see their service restored. And ultimately, he wanted to see their obedience restored. As the people began to lay the foundation of the new temple, each of these things began to take place. Reminds me of a song we used to sing in church a lot called Trust and Obey. Do you remember the next line? For there's no other way. And what's the next line? To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. These things walk hand in hand in this process of restoration. In verses 10 through 19, God reveals to Israel where they had been, where they were right now, and where he was going to take them if they trusted him. When you look closely at the timeline, it's apparent that the steps that Israel took back then are the steps that many need to take today. I could, could say that what we have in Haggai chapter 2 was a timeline of restoration before the people began to make progress, they first had to come to the realization it was time to rebuild. They had to turn from inactivity and misplaced priorities. They've done that now by this point of chapter 2, and now they're in a good place. At this point, Israel was about three months into the process. It was about September that they had begun to gather materials and make preparations. Now, in the last part of this chapter, it's about the 21st day of what you and I would know as December. And the Lord sent his people a message through Haggai. And the first thing that he wanted to address in this discourse was the past sins of God's people. In verses 10 through 14, on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priest what the law says. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment and that fold touches some bread or stew or wine or oil, does it become consecrated? And the priest answered, no, it doesn't. Uh, some of you are saying, what in the heck is he talking about? Um, he, he's just saying, hey, if you have things that you're going to use for a sacrificial offering and you have it in your coat or your purse and it touches something that is not good, is by touching it going to make it good? No, it's not going to do that, all right? It's non-transferable goodness, <laughs> all right? In, in other words, just because my daddy's good doesn't mean I'm going to be good, all right? And, and then he, he asks him another rather peculiar question. Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of those things, does it become defiled? Yes, the preacher replies, it does. Now, that's confusing. So the good stuff doesn't make bad stuff good, but the bad stuff can make good stuff bad. Yeah, that's what God's saying. That's why he tells us in the words, watch out for the company you keep. Watch out with what you do and where you do it. It can make an impact. He's letting them know. Because you see, the, the children of Israel were struggling. And so what were they doing? They were offering lots of sacrifices. They were going through the steps of worship with no heart for worship. And God says, all your good deeds is not going to count for anything. So God explains to them what sin is and how we're easily defiled. And then he not only explains what sin is, but then he lets them know how much he hates sin. Verse 14, then answered Haggai, so is this people and so is the nation before me, says the Lord. Every work of their hands, that which they offer is unclean. Though you're going through the ritual of religion, you are, have no heart for me. That's why you've ignored my house and you're building yourself beautiful homes. God explains in verse 16 that he's also going to bring judgment upon their sinful ways. They talk about in verses, uh, verse 16 how they've been planting and when they go to the house where they've stored their corn, they find half the amount of corn they thought would be there. 
When they go to the wine vats where they thought was full, when they show up, it's less than half full. In other words, all their work was producing much less than what they thought it should. And God said, I did that. You thought you could live life without me? You thought you could do better without me? Here's the result of your best effort. It's only half as good as what you thought it would be. That's my discipline. There are folks today who think attending church, giving offerings, and going to Bible studies is going to give them brownie points, and God's going to like you better. Does brownie points make sense to any of you all? Yeah, my crew right there of lovely ladies, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, boy, it's even going to get worse since we don't know the difference between Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts anymore. (laughs) We're not even going to know what brownie points are anymore. But anyway, uh, we think if we check the boxes that God is going to like us more and then he is forced to love us more. Trust me, we cannot earn God's love. It doesn't mean that that attendance and tithes and offering and sharing in missions isn't the right thing to do, but if you don't have the heart of Jesus in your worship, your worship is non-productive. In fact, it will end up being a matter of discipline between you and God. God also explains that he will judge it, all right? And, and he'll, you'll end up with less than what you thought for. Just may I remind you what 1 Samuel 15, 22 says. Uh, write this verse down. You probably won't have time to turn there before I read it to you. But write this down. You need to investigate this verse. 1 Samuel 15, 22, Obedience is better than sacrifice. Some people, you see, Israel was offering sacrifices without obedience. They were offering sacrifices to try to keep from having to build God's temple. I want to sacrifice this so that I don't have to do this that God wants me to do. Sorry, guys. That's not going to fly. Obedience is better than sacrifice. If you find yourself at a place of disobedience, God will reveal it to us. He will do this through his word. He will do this through the message. He will do this through the worship. He will do this through the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God lets us know that he despises our sin and he will discipline us. There are consequences for those of us when we are openly and rebelliously sinning against God. Without hesitation, God will discipline us. That was the case for Israel. It's also the same opportunity for us today. That brings us to the next phase in this timeline of restoration Uh, a place of the current obedience of God's people in verses 15 through 17. They went from inactivity in chapter 1 to activity in chapter 2, from neglect to faithfulness, from disobedience to obedience, from being disciplined to being blessed. And how does this take place? It takes place through God's discipline that brings us to a place of repentance. When we discover, when, when your parents disciplined you for being rebellious against them, Did you normally apologize before the discipline was administered? If you thought it was going to get you an escape from the discipline. Yeah, you knew judgment was coming, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You were not sorry for what you had done. You were sorry because you had gotten caught for that. It's usually after discipline had been administered, whatever form of discipline your parents used, it was usually after that form of discipline and you had some time to think about what you had done that then it brings us to a point of repentance. Uh, Paul Williams, the barber, uh, um, when he married Claudette, he, he got two, two, two daughters. They were, uh, they, they were about eight and ten. And uh, Paul was described, of course, I knew Paul as a very kind and patient gentleman, very kind and Claudette said, you know, he, we, we never saw him get angry except once. One night, he had to work late. He went out to his car. He left his lights on because it was a stormy day. It had been raining all day. It was still raining. He went out. He left his lights on. His battery was dead. Everybody had left the shopping center where the shop was. Not a problem. He didn't, days before cell phones, he went back into the shop. Called, called three hours, he called his house. But with two teenage daughters... 
each of them, before cell phones, each of them on the phone, they would not get off before ring through. So he walked home, wet, cold, hungry, angry. They want to know why he was wet, why he was cold. He explained to them he had been trying for three hours to get through, could not get anybody to come get him, and so he had to walk home. Everybody sort of apologized that evening. Oh, Dad, we're sorry, we're sorry. The next morning, Paul got up before he went to work while they were in the shower and the bathrooms getting ready for the day, and he removed the phones from their bedrooms and he put them in the trunk of his car. <laughs> they resided in the trunk of his car for an entire month. Every day after about day three, those girls begged, pleaded, and persuaded and apologized. Dad, Dad, we're so sorry. We will never do it again. You see, they didn't realize until later what the full consequence and problems of their misdeeds had been. And often the same is true with you and me. God disciplines for the purpose of restoring us back to a right relationship with Him. He does not, he does not discipline us to punish us. Please understand that. God's discipline is not for the purpose of punishment. God's discipline is for the purpose of restoration. That is why God does not discipline those who are not his children. The Bible says that. God does not discipline those. It says it this way. If you are his children and you willfully sin and God does not discipline you, then you are a bastard child. Did I say that out loud? That's what he says. He said, you're not mine. Otherwise... Your rebellion I would have dealt with with discipline because the purpose is to restore. He will judge those who are not His. He disciplines those who are His. And then once repentance comes, progress begins to happen. And God comes to them and He tells them in this passage, hey, what you're doing is good. You're laying the foundation stone upon stone. That's good. Don't stop! If you're here today and you teach a Sunday school class and you sing and worship and whatever the various things are that you are engaged in as, as the heart of worship and you're doing it right, here's what God has to say to you. Don't stop! As I look out at my 80-year-old Sunday school teachers that are out there, don't stop. Do you know when God wants you to stop? When He calls you home. When He calls you home. I suspect some have been called home prematurely because they stopped prematurely. The process of restoration is realization, repentance, return, and rebuild. And the last part that I want to point out is the future blessings of God's people. It's found in that last. Is there any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I'll bless you. God says, you've been planting and only reaping half of what you thought you were going to get. You haven't even got the stuff out of the barn yet. And I'm going to bless you before you do a thing. That is God's grace. They couldn't earn His love but when they respond to him in the way that God desires to be responded to, he blesses them beyond what their response could ever earn them. And the same is true for us today. Do you ever wish you could just start over in life? Staples, you know what I'm talking about, the store staples. I think they have made a fortune with their, their easy button commercials. You know what I'm talking about? They didn't make sense to me the first few times I saw them. I had to think about them before it figured it out, all right? I'm, I'm sometimes not the simplest. I, I think too simply. But the easy button. It's just, hey, we can do this. This is easy. But, but you know what I would rather have in life than an easy button? I would rather have an undo button. My favorite, my favorite thing on the computer is up at the top where I take my little arrow and I point out and it says undo because I have sometimes wiped out an entire page and a half of sermon notes with just an accident and I go up and I click undo and I get a, a new start. Can you imagine having a button that allowed us to undo anything that we've messed up? Messed up that relationship? Undo! Messed up that project? undo messed up that sermon undo but unfortunately we all know there's no such thing as an undo button in life once we've done it it's done 
No matter how bad we'd like to, we can't undo it. God, who is all-powerful and can do anything and everything, but there are some things he won't do, and undoing our past is one of those things. He'll not change it, but thank God he won't waste it if we will love him. God says, I will take the all things of life and I will use them for good if you will love and trust me. And even though the Lord won't change the past, he will do something better. He will give us a fresh start for the future. He did it for the children of Israel in the book of Haggai, and he will do it for you this morning if you will let him. Are you in need of restoration? It doesn't happen quickly but it can happen. And it will start when you recognize God's discipline in your life and you choose to repent. Let's pray. Our Father, I love you. When I was five and invited you into my life, I didn't think I could love you any more than I did that day. Father, when my grandfather died and I cried all night, And you sent some wonderful people into my world to comfort me. I didn't think I could love you any more than I did then. Father, after I had been pastoring for just a short time and I was fit to quit and wanted nothing to do with ministry again, and you, you spoke to me through an open window in a second story apartment room. And you whispered in my ear and you said, Finally, you've gotten out of the way so I can do something useful in your life. I didn't think I could love you more. There have been other moments in my life when I've seen and I've heard your handiwork. And I didn't think I could love you anymore. I can say I love you more today than I've ever loved you in the past. Father, you've had to discipline me and you've had to restore me. You've had to renew me and refresh me. But you do it so well when I finally say, God, I can't, but you can. You always said you would. There are some in this room today who maybe are at one of those places in their life. They're at a place of repentance for the very first time, they're going to invite you to come live within their life and become your child. No longer to be judged by you, but to be disciplined by you. Father, there are some who have slipped backwards and some maybe quite a long ways. They've shown up today just to hear this message so that they could not slip back forward, but so that they fully could be brought back forward. You didn't wait for the prodigal son to run all the way to the home, you ran out to bring him the rest of the way. And you threw a party. Father, you know what you're doing in the hearts of people at this very moment, and we thank you that they are choosing to let you do what only you can do in their lives, and for some, it's a fresh start. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Don't forget there are some things out here uh, in the pavilion you might need to do.